Welcome everybody, it's Cindy Kennedy and it is time for your Mojo Boost. But this time there's a little bit of a twist. I have a very, very special guest here today who I'll introduce you to in a moment. But she's got an incredible story. It's a story of hope, it's a story of tremendous courage, and I'm really looking forward to being able to learn from her. And hopefully we can all take some pearls of wisdom to support us in our journey. So some of you were actually are still here in Perth, and you may in fact know Kate. Others of you are from all over the world, so I think it's important that we just kind of just reiterate a little bit of your of your story, Kate, um, just to frame it. So, in uh, and if I get anything wrong, just jump in, okay? <laughs> All right. So, um, in November of 2007, uh, Kate was with some um, some people, and their boat late at night ran into a pylon. Now, a pylon for those of us in North America is just this little plastic thing, but well, as I understand, the pylons here are just huge poles of either metal or steel? Wood. This wood. one's wood. Yeah. So a big, huge wooden pole that comes right over the water, right? Um, and the boat smashed straight into it. And uh, Kate woke up, um, was it 10, ten, ten days, days later, yeah. um, from a coma. Um, she only had one in a million chances of actually even coming out of the coma. And uh, they were fearful that even if she did, that as you state in your book, you would most likely be a vegetable. So Kate woke up, and I just want to write, read out just some of, the, some of the challenges that she faced the moment she woke. She had a broken left ankle, fractured pelvis, collapsed left lung, shattered larynx, severed epiglottis, a torn esophagus, fractured vertebrae, broken mandible from joint splintered at, at front, and loss of seven and a half teeth. So, this is Kate Campbell, and I'm really, really happy you can be here, Kate. I'm happy to be here too. It's, um, it's a privilege, definitely. You know, it's really interesting, just before we get into your story, just these special meetings of the mind. I met Kate uh, just over two weeks ago, and the interesting thing enough is that about four or five months ago, I'd read about Kate's story, um, because her book, which I'll talk to you about in a bit, um, had just come out, and there was an excerpt about, about you. And I remember saying, oh, I really want to meet this woman, and I really <laughs> want to interview her. And sure enough, two weeks later, we're at the seminar, and uh, we get a chance to meet. And I love how things work out like that. Yeah, it's just, I don't know, um, destiny, universe conspiring together. I'm not sure how it works. It just always seems to work out that way. And we'll, we'll go with it, regardless of how it goes. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, Kate, you, you woke up, and... Well, we won't spend all the time and everything because it's such a such a huge story. What was the first thing that you remember? Um, I woke up and I couldn't comprehend what had happened. Um, my memory had actually reverted to the night before the accident, so mm. I didn't even realise I'd been on a boat. Mm -hmm. um, my parents were just bawling their eyes out at the end of the bed, and I couldn't move. I had just tubes coming out of me everywhere. I couldn't talk. My jaw was wired shut. I had a tracheotomy tube, so that was my airway to breathe and. I tried to talk to my parents and I couldn't, I was getting frustrated mm. and they're at the end of it just crying and they handed me um, what's a doodle board which is one of those magnetic sort of... You write down... Yeah, yeah. and then you wipe it clean and they handed me one of those and because um, I just finished my university exams I was used to writing really quick small notes um, so when I tried to write all the like mag magnetic pieces just joined together in a uh. line so my parents actually thought I was mentally disabled because oh, I wow. couldn't write. And then they encouraged me, like, write bigger. And so I wrote bigger. And the first words I wrote them is, what are you doing here? So they thought, oh, crap. They, were, they just, I didn't, they didn't realise I didn't know what had happened to me. I, I still couldn't comprehend that I was lying in hospital bed, still fighting for my life and my recovery. And when you, when you did realise what was happening to you, what did it feel like? Um, it took me... A long time to comprehend just how bad my situation was because mm -hmm. I was in ICU which probably for maybe just over a week but it felt like my whole hospital stay yeah um, when I was in there like I couldn't eat in the time and I thought oh it'll be in, like only a week and then I'll have tubes out and I'll be able to eat again but the doctors and the nurses and my parents and any visitors were really told not to tell me anything about how bad my situation was like um, mm -hmm. it was when I got moved out of ICU that I finally began to realize that I'd probably never eat or talk ever again for the rest of my life. And what went through your mind when that was what you were dealing with, going, God, I may never eat again? 
I may never talk again. Yeah, I just, I couldn't comprehend it. I guess I just sort of put it to the back of my mind. Like, yeah. I'm a very determined person, so mm. I was like, I am going to eat. I am going to talk. Like, all mm. the muscles in my throat were crushed from the inside out, and so they just, they were like rocks. They just, they were sutured there, but they could not move. Mm. And I basically said, you know what, I'm going to set my mind, and I'm going to make sure I do this, whether my body likes it or not. Right. And that's, that's one of the things that every time I've ever read anyone else's story who has kind of, I guess, won against the odds, um, usually that's the mindset that they've taken, is that I will do this. Yeah. Regardless of what doctors are saying, regardless of what the stats say, mm. I will make this happen. Well, that's the thing. Like My doctor, he saved my life, and he's the reason why I can talk and why I can now eat and drink. Mm. He used to operate on bullet wounds to the throat in South Africa. Oh wow! So he was specialised in reconstructing throats from so the inside out, um, and basically he said he he'd only ever seen four cases like mine. Two of them had died, and one had a permanent head tube, so they could eat for the rest of their lives. And he never expected me to make that recovery. Wow. Um, and the fact that I did like I fell into a deep depression when I finally got released from hospital and actually got readmitted because I couldn't even digest like ch things through a peg tube. A, pe a peg tube being? Um, it's a tube that goes directly into your stomach and then mm. you just pour liquid food and that's what keeps you alive from starving or dehydrating, basically. Right. Um, that was horrendous. I couldn't stomach this liquid diet. Like, every yeah. time... Th I think the hardest part was that I could eat through this tube um, and then I'd get sick and I'd vomit out of my mouth but I couldn't actually get anything in my mouth so I could get things out but not... Not, not in. Not in. Um, yeah. And that was horrendous. So I got readmitted because I, w I lost over 10 kilos um, in that time and right. I was dehydrated. I was, I was dying of starvation. And when I got to hospital, that's when I said, okay, snap out of it. You've got to do this. You've got to mm -hmm. set goals. Like, um, for example, most people won't realize, but um, you swallow 1.5 liters of sal sal saliva mm -hmm. a day. Um, yeah. And I was spitting 1.5 liters into a bag every day because I couldn't swallow it. So that's one one point five liters. That's that's huge. That's like a yeah a bottle of coke. <laughs> and you know it's interesting. I just came from the dentist this morning. You know where they like scoot like they suction all the saliva because it's so hard <clears throat> to keep your mouth up because you know it's all going down and keep your mouth and the not it not being able to swallow mm -hmm. or your or your or so much is going down. Mm -hmm. I just can't imagine. Yeah, you just you you well I people do it like subconsciously. You just swallow. You don't get told. Whereas. My nerve endings were all severed, so I would always notice when I needed to swallow, I always had to think, or when I had to spit, because then I'd start choking on my own saliva. Right. So I was like, okay, I'm going to start, number one, swallow my own saliva. If I can swallow my own saliva, it means they're working somehow. These muscles in my throat are right. doing something. And if they can do that, then I can work on them from there. So you were setting little goals? Little goals at a time. So that was my number one goal. Um, and by the time I got discharged from hospital the second time, I was only down to 250 mils a day. Amazing. So I realized, hey, my muscles must be doing something. So just those little tiny steps and little tiny goals to, to let you know that things are shifting, things are changing. Yeah. I guess those are little pieces of hope. Yes. As, as you move along, right? Very much so. And that's what we all need. Everyone needs a little bit of hope. I held on to a lot of hope throughout the whole process because I mm. thought hospital would have been the hardest recovery, you know. Um, I had voice therapy for over a year. Um, I was an outpatient at hospital for over two and a half years. Like, And then after that, I thought, cool, I'm recovered, I'll be fine. And then had to have a legal fight to get compensation from a family, I thought, that would just come forward and say, we'll cover whatever medical costs you need. But right. they didn't. So just, just to fill to fill everybody in, um, the boat that Kate was on was not insured. And so all of her medical bills was really footed by you and your family, Yeah, that's, right? that's correct. Um, some of the, w it was covered by Medicare, which is the Australian medical system, but majority was covered by my parents, yeah. Right, and, uh, and so the legal aspect of it, Tell us a little bit about, not just even how that happened, but what was the impact on you, knowing that you've been fighting so hard and so long to just be able to speak again, to be able to swallow again, just those small little things that we all take so much for granted. Um, and then suddenly you face this legal battle. Yeah, it was it was really overwhelming, like, because um, even when I got discharged from hospital, I had to have three further operations to reconstruct my jaw and my mouth on top of everything, because mm. um, I'd actually lost most of my teeth. 
and I remember the first time I met with lawyers because I said why do we have to meet with lawyers why can't we just go to the family and just say can you please just cover us for any, any out of pocket mm. um, and obviously you know not everyone thinks that way so this family wouldn't have a bar of it had already engaged in lawyers so we had to do the same and I sat there across from my lawyers they had all my medical records this thick and mm. um, they said oh I, I said I didn't have teeth I had dentures and they're like, oh really, can you show us? And made me take out my set of dentures and put them on the table at 20 years of age in front of a room full of lawyers. It was one of the most heartbreaking things I've ever done. I went home and I just cried because I was like, you have my medical records, all my files. Why, why would you do that to a 20 year old girl? Right, yeah. Um, it's almost too almost like proving. Here's your proof, but almost having to physically prove something. So are people believing your story? Yeah, I think it's because on the outside I did look quite okay like yes mm -hmm. I had some scars yes I looked a little bit malnourished but on the outside I looked generally okay but yeah. on the inside I was just dying like yeah. you say about finding your voice I was still trying to do that I was really into my drama and stage performances and yeah couldn't do that actually before the accident you'd be surprised my voice was very high-pitched and yelly was it yeah um, yeah now it's kind of crisp and sexy yeah you know of. it's uh, <laughs> you're getting into the womanhood stage <laughs> my voice is broken um, yeah. <laughs> yeah so um yeah no it's changed a lot but like um I'm not sad because I can't sing anymore. I can't mm. reach those higher pitches. I can't mm -hmm. scream or anything. But at the same time, you know, I can actually talk. And yeah, there's. It, it did actually take me a long time to find my voice. Like once I developed all the techniques in order to like speak from the back of my throat through mm. voice therapy. Mm. Um, from there, I set a goal to get on stage again, even in just a small part. Great. And what, what were you in? Um, a German play, actually. I studied German. Yes. And um, so it was even harder to have a small role speaking in German <laughs> on a stage. <laughs> She's setting herself up all these goals. <laughs> Why not? Goals along the way. Um, and it was really good. Like um, I, I practiced and practiced voice projection because it's something I couldn't do because of how damaged my vocal cords were. Yeah. Um, and I got there in the end and it was just such a great feeling. I bet. It was, it was good and it was bad because in a way I knew I could never really do that. Like if in a bigger role or anything like that, yeah. my voice couldn't handle it. But it was good to know that I reached that point where I could. Right. Even if I didn't do it again. Was it almost kind of releasing that dream, like still experiencing a piece of it, even though it wasn't how you imagined it? Yeah. And then be able to go, okay, there's this, this piece I can, I can do and I can experience, but the rest I, I can drop that. Yeah. It was sort of like that, definitely. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that was one of my goals. I set so many goals along the way. Realistic ones, though. Perfect, yeah. Um, you yeah. have to do small steps at a time. Like, um, when I started suffering badly from depression, I was really in denial about it because I didn't mm. want to be one of those people who was like, poor little me, look at my situation. Yeah. So instead I'd set... Sorry, well, hang on one second. We've got some um, noisy visitors. All right, back with you. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so yeah, when I started suffering from that, rather than seeking medical help or going on antidepressants, I'd set you know fun, realistic goals like um, write myself a list of ten things like um, see one new band every week and yeah. party till sunrise and go skinny mm -hmm. dipping like things oh, that you can <laughs> so much fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and just sort of um, uh, and go back to Germany, which was a place I loved and I felt safe and I was happy mm. there. <laughs> you know, one of the things that I um I just I want to pause actually pause for a minute. Um, this is Kate's book, and it's called My Story, and uh, I believe we all have our sto our own stories. And one of the things that really struck me when reading the book, Kate, was one how how real you were about. Well, first of all, it's written in such a real way. It doesn't feel like it's being sensationalized at all. It didn't feel like you were trying to write it. To prove a point, um, it felt like just this really beautiful everyday woman who faced extraordinary circumstances, um, who really reached in and, uh, I guess, using your German word, you know, just reclaimed part of your voice and also, as you call it, your Kraft. My Kraft. Is it called Meine Kraft? Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, and that's, and I love to ask you about the Kraft in a minute, but that's what I found really powerful. Secondly, is that. It wasn't just the, the physical 
aspect that you wrote about is that you you shared all of yourself you shared the fact that you you did you know you did suffer from depression and that there was a sexual assault and sexual abuse in a relationship that you faced and what i think is really great for everyone to hear is is someone who's willing to put that out there because i didn't sense any shame from you I, I don't know if you were purposely trying to write the book to kind of let go of any of that or if that happened along the way so can you just tell me a little bit about just coming to the book itself yeah um, i never intended to write a book it it sort of just happened my way of dealing with all my anger all, all the pain mm. all the trauma was just to write i'd write letters never sent so mm. instead of writing dear diary i'd write dear karma dear god i'd write to my best friend i'd write to a love interest i'd write to someone I met on the street who just gave me a nice smile and I'd mm. say thank you for that smile today yeah. and then eventually um, when I was preparing to go to court I realized that I'd had a laptop full of letters never sent and I was like I could actually potentially make a book out of this release it to mm. the people out there who need that little bit of hope yeah. that I always held on to and the whole reason I included everything from you know just not just rehab and recovery in the law case but also mental illness mm -hmm. um, physical assault, sexual assault, was because I needed to get all of the pain I experienced out of me and down. It was my healing process. Yeah. And for a long time with those experiences I had, I was ashamed and I was embarrassed by what had happened to me, especially mm -hmm. with sexual assault, assault for example. Mm -hmm. Like I, I blamed myself and it was a friend of mine that had did it and I don't know, it was it was hard, I, I ummed and art about including it, and I'm mm -hmm. like, you know what, this has happened, it is a part of me. Yeah. One in three women in Australia are sexually assaulted, mm -hmm. and only one in seven cases are actually reported. It's ridiculous, and yeah. I needed to have that in there to let anyone else know out there, don't be ashamed. And I just think that is so incredibly brave, because that's the big thing, is that we turn the anger to ourselves, or we get worried what other people are going to think, or, you know, and did, did anyone in your circle, like your friends or your family, were, did any of them go, oh, Kate, do you really want to put that stuff in? Did any of them did any think that or um, want to influence you a certain way? Yeah, um, well, even writing the book, I had a lot of, um, not hit back, but not a lot of support, so I lost a partner over it because he didn't support me re releasing it, and right. so for me, that I just decided I, I can't be with someone who doesn't support what I need to do for myself. My parents at first were very, very hesitant. They just wanted me to let it go, and I said, this is my way of letting it go. Yeah. Um, I told them about things I was including, which they didn't know about. That's what I was wondering, yeah. Um, they were very shocked, but yeah. at the same time, they didn't stop me from doing it because they knew it was what I needed to do. So that was good as well. Yeah. Um, one of the most shocking things after the release of the book, the man who actually did it to me um, managed to get in contact with me. Uh, yeah, he wrote me and just apologised profusely and mm. said how much he missed me. I think it was just a, a, a letter to make himself feel better about the situation and I guess he never truly realised how much it had traumatised me yeah. and how it's going to stick with me for the rest of my life. Yeah. And um, yeah, I wish he'd just stayed out of it, stayed out of my life completely. Right, so you didn't, you didn't need that letter and in fact it didn't do anything for you at all? It was just for him I think yeah. I healed a long time ago from that yeah yeah I just think that just to reiterate it is so incredibly important that there's so much a part of our stories and what I loved is that you owned it this is my this is Kate's story it's, it's your story as, as you have your own story and it doesn't really matter what anyone else thinks as long as you're true to yourself it's not about pointing fingers it's like this was my full experience of my life and I'm not going to apologize about it and I'm not going to allow it to dictate the rest of my life. Yes, exactly. And that's what right. I want to do, start, start a fresh, clean chapter, who knows what's out there for me. Yeah. Um, especially that this year has been an interesting year. Yeah, <laughs> it sounds like it has. Kate and I were catching up just a little bit before we uh, turned the camera on. So um, what is what is next right now? Like, Just give me a little flash of the, you know, the next month or two. Um, well, basically, I've just been made redundant a week ago. Um, Woo! <laughs> <laughs> At first, I was sad, yes, but um, ten week paid holiday. Can't complain. <laughs> the only reason I say that was when I met Kate. Um, she was just saying how she was, um, yeah, she's a bit over her work, and so I think the thing is, is once you make that claim, 
and you put it out there in the world, something happens. Yes. Right? So we gotta be very conscious with what we say and uh, get ready. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, very next week, redundancy. Um, mm -hmm. I was a bit sad at first because it wasn't on my own terms, but mm. that I'll have 10 weeks to sort out where I wanna go. Um, started motivational speaking, not getting paid for it. I just enjoy giving what I'm passionate about to others for the moment. And yeah. I find if you start charging for your passion, then it, then you lose it. The fire sort of burns out. Mm. So I'm still not sure where I want to go with the speaking aspect in with the book and surrounding mental illness and abuse, etc. Yeah. Um, but I'm just going to take a few weeks off to chill out. Yeah. Going to go over east, stay, um, work my way up the coast, stay by the ocean, and just just get back to myself, center myself, and then figure out where my life's gonna go from here. Yeah, and be ready, get ready for the ride. Get ready for wherever <laughs> it takes me. I have, have, I have an inkling, um, there's some international experiences coming up, but it's just an inkling. One yep. of those intuitional you, feelings coming up. Right, good, it's a good thing you're resting up then, because uh, <laughs> when, the, when the phone calls are come, you're, you're ready to go. <laughs> All rested and... <laughs> All rested and ready to take off. Yeah, the 36 hour plane ride. <laughs> So who knows? Um, but yeah, no, the, the book has definitely opened a lot of doors. Like I didn't intend it to mm. benefit me. Um, I just wanted readers to get a lot of hope from it. I've had so many strangers contact me through my old lawyers mm. or through the publishers writing letters just going, thank you, I needed to read something like that. Where can people um, get a copy? I mean, especially for those who maybe aren't even here in Perth yeah. or in Australia. Um, so again, just so you know, this is called My Story with, by Kate Campbell. Or how can people contact you? Um, they can contact me through UWA Publishing, the publishers. Okay. Um, otherwise, I do have an email address, so if you get in contact... I can I can write it down and send it to yeah. everybody. And actually, just yesterday, they released the e-book, so oh. it's... Hey, everyone! It's really, really <laughs> easy now, which is great. I didn't realise that. It was only just yesterday. I got... This is one of the emails I got this morning was saying we've now published the e-book on Amazon, on Kindle, everywhere, so it's mm. now available. Oh, that's really exciting. Yeah, that's great. So. You know what I love? I love that when you just did something from your heart and soul, and then you realize, oh, actually, this is something I could potentially share with others. It just seems to happen so naturally that, you know, you're not trying to make it happen, or what do people think? I think a lot of times, you know, we learn about marketing, and, you know, Kate and I both met kind of at a, more of a marketing kind of seminar yeah. for speaking, and... Uh, yeah, there's marketing so important, but more importantly, everything has to come from yourself and, and come from your voice. That's the most important thing, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. It's um, You can market yourself as much as you can, but if you're not honest and true to what you believe in or what you're working for, no one's ever going to buy it. Yeah. Whereas I haven't really marketed the book a lot. Um, my publishing team hasn't really pushed it as much as mm. what, I don't know how books are usually published, but mm. I just find it hasn't had that massive push. Yeah. Um, but for me, it's not about selling the books. It's more about helping the people out there who need that little bit of inspiration. Yeah. So I'm going to um, ask, we've got big highway going on here, <laughs> <laughs> but we're rolling anyways. Like I said to Kate when she comes over, I go, come over, we're casual. <laughs> and uh, we are. So if you were to share the top three lessons that you've learned thus far in life, um, especially when it comes to women, um, what would that be? Never be ashamed of what you've been through. Any yeah. experience you have is what makes you, and you should never be embarrassed by it, no matter yeah. what. Yeah. That's my number one takeaway. Mm -hmm. um, number two is probably always, always hold on to hope. Mm -hmm. Even when you want to give up and everything is just black. Yeah. Never never do. There's always a glimmer of a hope. Mm -hmm. You just may not be searching in the right corner. Mm -hmm. And number three, family and friends, they're just irreplaceable. Yeah. And no matter how hard you're having a time in life, they'll always be there. All you have to do is ask for help. Mm -hmm. That's the bravest thing that one can do is ask for help. Yeah. You know, spot on. And, uh, I hope this resonates with you. I know it resonates with me profoundly, every single thing that you mentioned. And I know with the Mojo Boost, um, the whole incentive is to help people find um, their, their mojo, which is really their inner resilience, their inner wisdom, um, their inner strength. And when we ask for help, you know, we let people in. And, uh, yeah. you know, when we let go of shame, 
we're able to find the truth. It's very true. Yeah. And to be honest, I think through the whole ordeal, through the rehab, the recovery, the trial, um, the burst of media and my face being shoved into the public spotlight, mm. out of everything, I think the hardest thing I ever had to do was admit I wasn't okay and I did need help. So. Most power thing ever. That's so powerful and I think it's probably a perfect note to close on. So thank you so much for being here, Kate. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. <laughs> I'm so excited. I'm so excited that you are using, that you've gotten your voice back. Yes. <laughs> for so many reasons, you know, um, because there's so many of us that need to hear that, you know, because our own stories are a voice of hope for somebody else. And I know your story is the voice of hope for someone and you may not even know who it is. Um, so before we hang up, I just have to use this word because uh, Minecraft, it's such a fabulous word. There's certain words that just really resonate. And I think the one thing about German, I studied it for only two years. It's a very, I found a very strong, solid language. So I think when you're wanting to become more empowered, right, and connect to that, like that fierce knowingness in you. And uh, I, I, I just heard your word Kraft. And I'm like, yeah, I like that. <laughs> so I know it's it's hard to express it in English, but how would you describe what the word kraft means? Loosely translated, it's strength or power. Mm. But for me, it's more than that. For me, it's not just a word of strength. It's strength, power, courage. Um, it's that solid, I don't know, even know how to explain it, that solid spirit inside of you that can stand tall. Mm. No matter how dark the day is, no matter how hard the problem is, Mm -hmm. your craft is what keeps you going when you mm -hmm. don't have any energy left yeah. yeah and you know I think when you said your three your three lessons I think when you use any one of those those are the ones that help you reconnect with your craft definitely because I lost mine for so long yeah and I'm so glad I reconnected with it and recognized that that was the part of me that was missing and that was the part of me that enabled me to continue my fight and I keep saying we're going to stop, but we're not, because there's just too much to ask. It's a long book. It's a long book. <laughs> I was actually quite shocked. But, um. <laughs> it's very accessible. But because we've got it, Kate, I'm just going to keep, keep you here for another moment. Some of us, we, we feel that something's not right with us, but we might not even know that it's our own power or our craft or something that's missing, you know? That's why I call it, you know, how to get your mojo back, because there's just something you're just not feeling right how do you how what are your signs when you know that you're not connected to it because sometimes we can disconnect just for a moment or sometimes for a couple of days or like you did for a very long time what are your signs when you realize you're just starting to not connect with it as much i feel genuinely tired like i'm a very energetic person yeah. and for those days i don't want to get out of bed or go do some exercise or spend some time in the sun i know something's mm -hmm. not right to get it back i normally go by the water yeah, whatever's closest. It could be a lake. Generally, I love to go to the beach, mm -hmm. and I just put my feet in the water and just regain the energy back I need. Have a think, and find out what's plaguing me, what's making me feel this mm -hmm. way, and how can I tackle this issue to get back to where I need to be. So what I'm hearing is nature, yeah. self inquiry, and still the b deepest belief within that this is momentary. That you still have the power to change it once you're actually able to reflect on what it is you need. Yes. And then asking for it. Exactly. We've solved the world. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Wouldn't that be good? <laughs> Wouldn't that be good? So, uh, again, thank you so much for coming. Thank you for having me, as well. For sure. And I'll share Kate's information and how you can get a copy of her ebook um, down below. So, uh, you guys just keep, keep believing in your story and keep believing that. Uh, well, there's hope. And like Kate said, if you're not feeling it, you can't find it, look in a different corner and certainly ask for help. And that's what we're here for, is to constantly to support each other and to share the power of your story with everyone else. Because we don't, we can't do it alone. Um, we do it together. So have a great week, guys. Can't wait to see you next week. See ya. See ya.